also, I guess I'll preface it to say that I don't think I always think very well off the cuff, so I hope my answers make some sense, but I have a sense of ambivalence about the word. And so in one sense, I think about how people have reclaimed a lot of terms. So I think about um, the black community having reclaimed that term or the queer community reclaiming terms uh, for themselves. And I think about um, the Mad Pride movement and, you know, or the Crip movement and how people use things that used to be considered stigmatizing as terms that they are, are radically using to define oneself. But so I understand, um, but I guess I don't, I, at the same time, I hear a lot about respectful language and it's important to me. And so um, I, there's a lot of really rational arguments about how um, terms such as, you know, idiotic or, you know, and crazy and, you know, manic and using these things so flippantly in society, how I'm um, using, you know, it's stigmatizing to do so. So it's odd because really um, growing up crazy was a word I used a, a lot. It was essentially like an adjective, like to say, a lot of, or, you know, kind of like, you know, a man, is, you know, he's got crazy skills or whatever. It's raining like crazy. It just was a filler. But um, I never really associated it with what it truly means or meant. But I think that's, that I think was, is probably a privilege in itself. Um, because even someone with, you know, a psychiatric disability, uh, with um, there's still a, I guess, a sense of separation that one can allow themselves to have a, f a form of cognitive dissonance, I guess. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. So um, I used to say that all the best people, you know, are those that are, that are kind of off, kind of weird, kind of different. And um, I, I've i always known that something about me was different. And um, there was a, lo a lot of my life that I, I didn't understand it. And to, to be honest, I still don't understand all of it, but there was a lot of my life that it bothered me, not because it in itself really bothered me, but just because of presenting differently than others or processing differently than others. Um, it, it created anxiety for me. Um, now, I mean, it is what it is. You know, I, I it ebbs and flows, but yeah, and you know, it's, it's certainly something I think. <laughs> so I think they'd be so ready to be back in their own body just because um, my normalcy, I think is, is you know, not that of, of someone else's. So um, this is all I know. It, it's like a fish in water, you know, you don't really feel wet. The wetness is, is natural to you. And so like the way my brain um, works, it is always, you know, firing rapidly, always thinking of something. There, there's tangents on top of tangents, on top of rabbit, tra um, whatever, rabbit trails, on top of all of these different paths. Um, it's constantly um, branching out and webbing out into other thoughts or ideas. It's hard to keep focused. I, I think ahead and then, um, and then sometimes overreact to things, um, perseverate on things too much. It's, it's to me, like when you walk in a room maybe and someone's like, they can't find anything, but you know, it's in that drawer on the left, you know, the third drawer on the left over there. And you know, it's like coordinated chaos, I think <laughs> of sort. So, um, for me, um, Inertia is a struggle for me. I'm trying to um, get motivated to um, do things that I know I need to do. Um, organization is definitely a struggle um, for me as well. Um, I have time agnosia, so I'm managing time. I can get lost in something um, and, and just engage in it for hours and or I can underestimate how long something is going, how much I'm gonna need time for something, um, to do something. Um, the um, executive functioning is is in a struggle for me. I am the least <laughs> have the least executive functioning of, of probably anyone that um, that I'm acquainted with. Uh, it's just it's an area that I've always had difficulty with and, and still do. Um, sensitivity I think is one. And anxiety um, is one uh, as well. Um, 
socialization it, it can be as well. I, I, I can, I have um, developed mechanisms to deal with a lot of these things. Um, you know, I guess kind of to tolerate them or to kind of keep functioning, but it still takes a toll. Um, and I think um, having, trying to have a sense of, of, of balance or homeostasis within myself, um, you know, in, you know, in the midst of, you know, overwhelm, in the midst of, um, you know, circumstances beyond one's control, um, that's also something that is challenging for me. Um, I um, also struggle with a lot of self-doubt. I'm a, a very, very critical of myself and um, need to learn sometimes um, limits and, and balances and um, not to overthink things, I think. Well, I don't know, I'm probably still gonna overthink them. I guess I shouldn't say I don't need not to overthink them, but it's something that I do. I'm afraid of that which I can't predict or control. Um, so the unknown is frightening to me. Um, I'm afraid of mediocrity, I think. Um, I'm afraid of um, of loss, even though I know it's a, a, a sense. It's part of life. It's reality, but it is something that I that that I'm fearful of. Um, I'm afraid of failure, even though I also know that I fail, and I acknowledge that um, that I'm very imperfect, very flawed. I still push, and um, it's difficult to um, to not meet my own expectations. I love to read. I love, love, love reading. Um, I love Steven Universe. Anything about Steven Universe, I love watching it. I love looking up um, information about it online. I love um, cosplay. Um, I like travel. I don't travel as much as I would like. I mean, actually, I do travel a lot, but they're for speaking engagements. But I like leisurely travel too. Like I, the beach is my favorite place. So anywhere where there's a beach, a gorgeous beach where I could just sit and be there, um, that I love. I enjoy music as well. I enjoy writing um, and um, some cinema. I'm not that sophisticated of a, of a movie buff. I'm There's movies that are, you know, corny and predictable that I still like to watch <laughs> anyway, even though I know they're corny and predictable um, just because I'm a big kid. So th this is something that I find funny when I look back at it. Um, to me, it's funny. It's probably silly, but um, so when I was dating my husband, um, he uh, he um, and I we were friends some years before, and um, we reconnected, you know, several years later. And when we were dating, I wanted to do something nice for him. And so I'm a very literal thinker, and so um, I had read this book where this person was talking about how relaxing it felt to um in a summer day to take powder and you know put it between your sheets and kind of relax and i had never in my life done that i was like hmm, powder between your sheets but i was like okay that's what i'm gonna do for him that'll be so sweet i'm just if powder feels like relaxing and calming i'm going to you know reward him with some powder so i got i went and bought some some powder and um cornstarch, you know, big old thing of baby powder. And so I, you know, lifted back his sheets, you know, just pulled them all the way back. And I probably dumped half the, the can of baby powder all over the bed, like throughout the entire bed. And um, I was like, this is so sweet. You know, he's gonna love this. He's gonna feel so relaxed. And so he came in and he was like, hey babe, I was like, hey. And so he came and he sat down, like he plopped down on the bed and this big cloud of, of powder just flew everywhere. Like, and he looked like, what is going on? And I was like, I put powder in your bed. And I was so proud of myself and happy because I was thinking, oh, I'm so sweet. And little did I know that he's thinking, do you, are you trying to insinuate that I stink? Like, why are you saying I need powder in my bed? And he didn't stink, but I just, I didn't realize that it could be, you know, perceived that way. So he was like, this is a lot of powder. And I was like, yes, I know. Isn't that great? And he's like, okay. And so he decides that he's going to take it and go shake it out on the porch because it's so much of it, it's just ridiculous. So then he goes to go put his shoes on, um, the, a pair of shoes on to, to, put, to take it outside. And then I had dumped the rest of the powder in his shoes because I felt like if it feels good on your bat, on your body, it's gotta feel great on your feet. So then he looked in and his shoes had like this big mountain of powder and he just like dumped it out. And then he's like, what on earth? And I said, you don't like it? And he was like, no. And so 
um, that was kind of the last time I did the powder thing. And um, later on, he confided to me that, you know, that his feelings were hurt. And I was like, I had no idea your feelings were hurt. I was just trying to do something nice. And he was like, I thought, he said, you had me like double showering before I came to see you and stuff like that. And so now we joke about it and laugh about it. Like it, again, cause I took the book literally, I don't know, maybe they meant just sprinkle, I don't know, a handful or maybe less powder, but yeah, I, I overdid it. So it's interesting um, when, I used to, it, it, there have been different aspects of my social life. Um, there have been times in my life, you know, that I've been essentially friendless. There have been times that I had like kind of a core committed group of people that um, they got me, they, you know, they accepted me and those were my people. And um, when I was younger, um, you know, I had periods where I would either not socialize or I would socialize frequently. There are certain things that I like to do and when I like something I'm kind of all in. So and you know growing up with a strict immigrant family um, when I got out of the house college age and you know I could go clubbing you know because I loved music um, that was the thing to do. So I went on ladies night which was usually Tuesday. I went on college night which was Thursday and then of course I went off Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So um, yeah I did a lot of that um, just to dance and have fun with friends and you know you know, I enjoyed that, even though it was, it was also kind of overwhelming to the, the environment. But um, I used to socialize a lot. And then, um, you know, I kind of got burnt out on it and um, kind of cocooned a little bit more. And and then um, later in life, you know, when life starts to change in terms of having family responsibilities and work responsibilities, for me um, as an educator, um, I have to be on, I have to people a lot. You know, I want my students to really learn. I, I like, I believe in multimodal learning and engagement. So um, I, even though it'd be a lot easier for me to kind of, you know, be disengaged, I try to be very demonstrative, very, um, you know, I don't know the term I'm looking for, um, animated and so forth, um, kind of really, really um, initiate dialogue and all of this, as well as incorporating technology so that the students who are more precarious can feel like they're learning for the students who are more visual or auditory or whatever, I try to hit, you know, all of those angles. And so at the end of a day, a, a work day, I'm drained. Um, from, from socializing, from talking, from smiling, from answering questions, from um, trying to anticipate people's needs. And it's a lot. So, um, and then I have my kids and of course I have to be, you know, on for them. Although I don't have to be on in the same way. I can easily say, mommy needs a break, you know, go to another room, <laughs> get off me, you know, and <laughs> with a smile and they, they get me. But, um, um, so social media allowed me to do a lot of socializing for for quite some time um, but then that started also getting overwhelming for me so now I, I guess I I require a lot less socialization I think than the typical person like um like a, a nice day for me is a day where I, I can just just lounge I don't have to do anything I can be it flip-flops um, and t-shirt and just relax and maybe not deal with anyone watch some movies read some books text some people and then when i'm done put it down and not have to be like i like people but then people could be too much for me so um i don't think i i have much of a social life because i'm very busy and so when you have to you know kind of i guess um reduce some things to, to function, to cope. Um, that's kind of like usually the first thing to go, um, for me, I guess. Um, because I, I guess I feel like my family f f fills my social quotient, um, and my advocacy and the people that I engage with in a lot. So it's hard for me to just go to a movie with somebody or go to coffee, but, but I do sometimes. And I do, I'm grateful that I have some people that, um, I really admire and respect who consider me friends, their friend who trusts me. And for me, it's more about how I feel about a person, um, than the, um, frequency of my, um, communication with them or even the, the manner in which I communicate with them. Someone can be a good friend to me and we, we might have not physically seen one another in person for, for years. You know, and I can still feel that sense of closeness to them. Sometimes I wish I had more spoons and, and you know, could kind of exert a little more emotional energy because there's certain things that I'd like to do or, think, or people I really like, but I just can't handle um, what it, it requires to um, 
to be around them, to make those emotional deposits of, of quality time. Uh, for example, I travel a lot and there's people usually in every city that I go to that I would love to hang out with, to see, to spend time with. And I, I would enjoy it actually, but sometimes I just can't, like I'm just too done and I just need to kind of do whatever task I'm there to do and then leave. So if I could find a way to have like maybe more reserves of emotional energy so that I could, you know, not because I want to socialize in a neurotypical way. I still will be my, you know, usual, you know, neurodivergent self, but just so that I could um, cultivate some of these connections and relationships because some people do need that regular um, ongoing, you know, interaction with you to feel close to you, even if you feel close to them. So to be more reciprocal, it'd be nice if I had the ability. I have a love-hate relationship with the it gets better messaging that people use because I think that things sometimes get better and things sometimes get worse. I think that the, the pendulum swings multiple ways. I think it's um, not something that's really static. And um, for me, what I would say is that I think that um, every human being that you see, that you encounter, uh, we're all different. We all have different struggles. We all have different strengths. So we, um, you know, some people are, are you know more privileged in terms of the circumstances that they have in life or but everyone has some type of struggle or internal issue that you don't know about uh, and it's not necessarily that you need to know about it but it's just often you feel like it's you're the only one who doesn't have it together people have it together more than you you're you should just be able to um to to continue to persevere to produce to engage and you can make yourself make things worse for yourself by um being judgmental um, by um, having you know unrealistic expectations by not allowing yourself to have what you need you know be if it's time or if it's you know an opportunity to try again or resources or um, support or assistance to um, for whatever it is that you need um, I think people need to try to learn um, to to develop a, a at least a neutral sense of self, if, if not a positive one. I think only focusing on the negative, I think, you know, can be damaging, can be very harmful and debilitating. Um, I know that I've, um, in recent years, I've been a lot more open about um, myself and my neurology, but, I, you know, since I was um, either 11 or 12 years old when I was first diagnosed with depression, um, and um, I kept a suicide journal when I was 12 years old of all the different ways that I wanted, to, I really wanted to be gone, you know, and it wasn't for attention because I didn't tell a single soul. Um, I just, you know, just wanted, it, I just felt like it was too much. It was too overwhelming and I just didn't want to continue in this life. I didn't see positive for my future. Even if there was, I just didn't feel like I had the, the mental capacity, the bandwidth to continue living this life in, in this world and in, in, in as me. And so, but I was also p terrified of pain and I also didn't want to cause unnecessary pain to others more than my loss would create. So. Um, I would matter of factly list out different ways to, um, one could commit suicide and then I would eliminate certain ways because I wasn't going to do it because it was going to be too painful at the end of the process, or it was going to require some type of device I didn't have access to, or, or someone would find me and it would be so gruesome and traumatizing for them to find my body in that manner that it wouldn't work. So there were only a few methods that were left that, you know, seemed that, I thought would work. And so this, I was very serious about this. Um, it was something that I meant and I, I have had, so, you know, so, but there, and there've been other periods of my life. I've had su suicidal ideation. I've also had attempts. I've been hospitalized, um, in psychiatric ward. I've had day treatment. Um, I, I take antidepressants. I take, I am in therapy and, um, I actually have a therapist that is actually decent is actually good actually understands me I think therapy can do a lot of harm sometimes um, and um, if it's not the right type or if they don't understand your needs or um, you know if there's not a, a good fit and so I, I just want people to know that um, you it's it's not always you know butterflies and rainbows and unicorns there's struggle and sometimes you don't know when it's going to end or if it's going to end and, and it can be difficult it can be hard um, I would advise those who have a loved one who you know struggles with um, with depression or anxiety or to try to be empathetic 
if they can, to try to be accommodating, understanding, um, to hear them out and not patronize them. All of the platitudes, they don't change one's circumstances. Sometimes you just need to, you know, to sit with your circumstances. And then I think that um, there is a lot of pressure on people f to conform to societal norms, to get over your depression or to improve or to um, be resilient or to act like everything is okay because of your faith or your positive attitude or your circumstances. And I think it's okay to be who you are. It's okay to say today effing sucked. You know, I'm struggling. I'm having a hard time. Um, I, you know, everything didn't go according to my standards. It's, it's okay to say that. It's okay to feel it. I think feelings are feelings. They're not wrong, but what you do with them can be, can be what's problematic, can be dangerous or can be harmful. So I think that um, being introspective and being, you know, a little kinder to oneself um, can go a long way. Well, there's a, my husband and I have this joke sometimes about our kids. Like when one of them does something um, we don't like, I'll be like, that's your son or that's your daughter. And so like, I find it funny. But um, if someone else is to be like, you know, what's to criticize, you know, we think it's a lot of things they do are, you know, cute. And so, but if someone else was, I'm very, very mama bear about my kids. I'm very, very protective. So it's like, that's, that's as far as we joke. Like, I don't believe in, you know, um, belittling my children or anything like that. So um, that's kind of like our limit. You know, it's just kind of like basically jokingly saying, yeah, he did something, you know, really ridiculous. That's your kid. You know, he tastes after you, you know, type of thing. But if someone else was to, um, to say something, you know, negative about my child, no, not, no, not going to work. <laughs> Definitely not funny. I'm probably getting cut off. Yeah, I'm very, very protective over my kids. I think that um, one thing that would have helped me, um, I always kind of had this sense that my life, I, I was kind of going from one crisis to another, one catastrophe to another. And so given that and then, you know, trauma in my past and circumstances, um, it wasn't pleasant, but it was understandable that I um, had, you know, struggles with depression or anxiety or what have you. And I felt that it would subside at some point. And I remember when life started to calm down, when some positive things started to happen, when um, some victories started to occur and I wasn't in survival mode. And yet those feelings, those feelings of depression, uh, those struggles remained with me. And I remember feeling very hopeless, like, is this always going to be me? Is this always going to be my life? Like, you know, like I knew that I know it's a chronic illness. I know that, it, you know, I understand the nature of the diagnosis, but I guess there's still a part of you that, um, I don't know the mentality of health, wellness, sanity, getting better, how you're supposed to present or how you're supposed to be. And, um, I learned that I am exactly where I am in life. And um, so I, I, I try to, it's self care is difficult for me because I'm an overachiever, I'm a go getter, but I do try to build in things that work for me. Like I don't, uh, if, if certain clothes are uncomfortable, I'm gonna take them off. If um, a certain sound or smell is problematic, I try to avoid it. I don't care how it looks anymore. I, I try to do what helps me to thrive. So yesterday, for example, when I got in the elevator, there was someone who had been smoking. And it's her prerogative, but I'm like, dang, I mean, she was just, she smelled like an ashtray. I mean, she had hair, jacket. And so I'm a grown woman, but I was in the, in the elevator and I held my nose because it freaking stinks. Why should I have a headache? I'm not trying to be insulting. I didn't say, ew, you stink, you're so nasty, you smoke. That's disrespectful. I'm not going to say that, but I moved as far away from her as possible. I could still smell it. So I, a lot, there's a lot of things that people used to do that was natural to them as children that people are socialized out of doing and why for the sake of what you know like so I don't throw birthday parties because the it's stressful for me to be a host host hostess whatever the term is plan things coordinate not knowing people are coming feeding them socializing engaging so I don't do those and because it's not it doesn't work for me uh, and so um, sometimes you know if something you know, if someone invites me to something and I feel like I can't go, I now I'll just say I'm not up to it or I'm not able to. I don't make up an excuse like, oh, I have to go do this thing. Um, I just, if I can't do it, I can't do it. If it's if it's too much for me to handle, if I feel like it's too much, like it'll be pushing myself too much. I'm not ashamed anymore to um, 
to decline something because it's not the way things work for me or to ask for clarification or or repeat something because it's what I need to do. Um, I am no longer um, allowing the, um, the the gilded cage of normalcy to um, to cast a, a, a cloud over my life anymore. I'm just going to be me uh, for better or for worse and people can take it or they can leave it. And so um, I hope that people will learn that um, you, you know, there's beauty in you, even with all the brokenness and, you know, there's a lot more people out there than you think, than you know, who are, are, are in the same situation as well. You're not alone and you're not wrong. You're not a burden. You're not broken. You're just you.